Okay, I think we'll get started. <clears throat> My name is Benjamin Greenspoon. I'm the clinical director of Nesivos in Lakewood. Just a little bit about my involvement in this field. First, I want to say it's a big schos for me to be here. <clears throat> I haven't been to Keshenavshi in the past, and it's, uh, it's really an overwhelmingly rich experience for me just to be here. Do I have a mic there, or is that? Yeah, it's clipped to you. It's clipped to me. Can you can you hear out of there? Okay. As long as it's clipped, that's yes. okay. Fine. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I did. So uh, we only have, I mean, we're officially supposed to start, stop at 2.30, so I'm going to try to keep to that. So I'll try to move along as, as we go, but I'd like to get some, some input, absolutely. So I've been working with struggling teens and their families for 21 years in Lakewood. I have like a part-day yeshiva work um, for boys that are 16 and up. And Nesivos is more of a clinical program where we meet struggling boys and girls and their families and help direct their care. Um, I have a small private, private practice as a therapist and I, I'm a trauma therapist. And it was very interesting how over the years for my own development, it was very interesting how I started working with these kids and I had the same question. I had the same question. They have all sorts of challenges and I think whoever is newer here, you'll get this over, over the Shabbos and whoever's been here for in the past, this will be simple to you. These kids, when they have emotional issues, when they have challenges in their developmental years, it manifests in challenges in Yiddishkeit. And I had the same question. Why does it manifest specifically in Yiddishkeit? And what I realized working with these kids towards the beginning of my career, where we started working with the kids on a, on a just an individual way as a lay person. We were giving them chizik, we were taking them out, we were giving them individual attention. We were giving them more space. We were giving them unconditional love. <coughs> we were making all sorts of deals with them, incentives. And I realized over time that I was, bump I was bumping into trauma. Some of the kids it worked for, and for some of the kids it was like hitting a brick wall. And I realized I'm bumping into trauma. I'm bumping into trauma and I was bumping into developing personality disorders. And I went to school. And my interest was understanding trauma and family systems because I, I saw how much of this affects people's families. I shifted a lot of my focus and attention to families because I've come to see how much more of a difference you can make towards the child when you have the families on board as opposed to working just individually with the kids. You can be the best therapist in the world. You can be the most motivational person in the world. But you only see these children a certain amount of time every day. And then they go home to their families. So if they have a family environment which understands them, which can provide them with the support they desperately need, which can get out of the way of all the other issues that are coming up, which manifest in, in the families, <coughs> their healing becomes that much faster. That much faster, I want to say also, that much healthier. My, my, I'll get to you in a minute. My private practice where I see people for trauma work, most of my cases are kids that have gone gone off and come back. A lot of them are young and married, some of them are not so young and married, some of them are looking to get married, but that's my, that's my clinical practice. So, why do some kids struggle, have emotional issues, go through hardships, and it doesn't affect their Yiddishkeit? And why do some kids 
struggle, have all sorts of different problems, and affects their Yiddishkeit. So I'm going to describe maybe what is kind of a typical kid that struggles to the point that it starts catching up with them and it starts affecting their Yiddishkeit. But before, we'll talk about some of the kids that are not as prone. There are some kids that when they go through something, they don't think very deeply about it. They don't tend to dwell on issues. They don't overanalyze themselves in life situations. They have some good days, they have some bad days. They have some good teachers, they have some bad teachers. They don't have this sense of independence that they feel that's upon them to figure out what's going on, why it's going on, how it's going on, what their role in it is, why it's happening to them, if there's something wrong with them, it's not the way their brains work. They come home at the end of school and they have a supportive family environment. They can come and tell their parents, they have enough expressive language, they can come and tell their parents that they had a bad day. And their parents can give them some extra affection. They can help soothe them. They can do something for them. And they go to sleep and they have a better day the next day. These are the types of kids that also when they come down, they have the ability to reset themselves. They're the type of kids when they get upset, they know how to calm themselves down. They also don't have so many overwhelming, overwhelmingly negative life situations. I don't think any of the kids of any of you who are sitting here today really fit that profile. Those are not the kids that end up going off the derach. Those are not the kids who end up abandoning Yiddishkeit and abandoning uh, Tznias, Shmir, Shabbos, etc. I want to give you a, a, I want to give you a story about a very typical type of situation where it's almost to be expected that there are life challenges, the challenges that they went through. It'll be a miracle if they don't affect their Yiddishkeit. So I want to tell you about Chaim. Chaim is a very special neshama. He's sensitive, he's soft, he's a deep child. He thinks about things in a very personal and a deep manner. He cares very much about what's happening. He cares why things are happening. He asks deep questions. He's the type of kid that when he hears something, a tzorah that's going on in Kla Yisrael or something that happened to somebody else, he's the type of kid who takes a tillum to bed. He gets a bit, uh, uh, upset about when there's unfairness to others. This Chaim has a predisposition to struggle if life gives him challenges. It's not because he's a bad kid. It's not because he's worse than the first child that we described. It's because he cares. It's because he cares too much. We raise our kids. What's the first words we tell our children? What do we tell them? The first thing that we tell them to, when we tell them when they start talking, we tell them Taritzi Vilanu Moshe. We tell them the first thing when they start talking, we want them to know what it feels like to be a Yid. We have the Torah. This is our Masera. What's the first thing they do when they wake up from the first time that they can remember? They wash Negevaser and they say Moidani. What's the last thing they do when they go to bed? They say Kriyashma. Their lives, from the moment they wake up, from their earliest memories, till the time they go to bed, it's part and parcel of every living moment is the background of Yiddishkeit. Highlights of family life. Shabbosim and Yom Tovim. It's when we sit around together as a family. What do we do? We sing Zmiris. We talk to every Torah. We talk about the Parsha. We talk about all sorts of Nisim and Flois that happened to Klai Yisrael. Yiddishkeit is part and parcel about when you're growing up in a from family how you feel about yourself and your relationship with life. 
It's one of the deepest things that you'll ever have a connection to in life. Chaim, our story about Chaim, he grew up in a house like this. It was a nice house, a healthy house. He heard the most amazing stories when he first went to school. He heard, learned about the Alves Akdashim. He heard stories about Tzadikim. He learned about amazing mitzvahs. He sang songs about how sweet Torah is. And then life started to send him some curveballs. Chaim had a learning disability. His friends were grasping what the Rebbe was saying. Try as Chaim could, he couldn't understand what was going on. Chaim got picked on by a bully in the class. He was treated like he had saras. <clears throat> I heard this from many kids. Anything they touch becomes tummy. Nobody can touch it. It's a horrible, horrible way to feel. He doesn't tell his parents what's going on. They have no idea. Well, Chaim has a hard time learning. He gets yelled at by his rabbi. He's sent to the principal because he was doodling. He wasn't following direction in class. Chaim was completely confused. Chaim develops anxiety, racing thoughts. It becomes harder and harder for him. What was already difficult to focus becomes harder and harder for him to focus. His palms are sweaty before he walks into the school building. He's afraid constantly that people are going to see that there's something wrong with him. Why can't he learn? Why can't he focus? Why is he different than the other kids? Why is he not being matzliach? Chaim was shown pornography by a classmate after school on the way home from a smartphone that his friend found. If Chaim had all of these things, it would be a miracle if Chaim wouldn't go off the derech. Any one of these things are enough to completely shut Chaim down. And I've only said some of them. Chaim, he's got this deep sensitive neshama. What does he do? He davens to Hashem. He pours his heart out when he goes to sleep at night. He begs Hashem to make life easier. All he wanted to do was to learn like other kids. He wants to be happy. At some point, when life stops making sense, his whole Yiddishkeit stops making sense. It becomes too painful. It becomes too painful to think of all his shortfallings in Yiddishkeit. It becomes too painful for him to think that he can't learn Hashem's Hei Luka Torah. He's so frustrated that Shfilas Moran answered that he can't bring himself to Davin anymore. After he stops participating in all the things that he was supposed to do, deeper and deeper and more troubling feelings settle in. I'm a disappointment, I'm a failure, I'm worthless, I can't make it. These feelings, they spread out in three areas in life, in his family life, in his social life, and his relationship with Hashem. A child feels good when they make their parents proud. They feel good when they're doing the right thing, when they're being a good kid. They feel good when they have a good social standing. When they're not performing as they should, all of these areas become threatened. Chaim finds it very hard to feel good around his parents. When he brings home failed tests, he has to have them signed. <clears throat> it's very easy to see when you see parents going to T uh, PTA. It's very easy to see who's got the successful kids. Anybody who's a Rebbe here, See the parents walk in with a smile and they walk out with a smile and they have a skip in their step. And the ones who don't have the successful st uh, kids, it's also very easy to see. Chaim doesn't want to see their face when they come home from PTA. He wants to stay in his room in those days. A person saw a child's social life. There's social roles, there's a social identity. When a child grows up, they think of themselves as part of a family unit <coughs> where they live, where they go to school. They're not old enough yet to think of themselves as individuals with certain personalities, they have certain strengths, they have skills, they have interests. 
This happens later on in healthy teenage development. Younger children think of where they fit in, in their family, in their school, and with their friends. I'm Chaim, I live in Muncie, I attend Yeshiva's Beis Stavid. If all is working well, that identity is a good identity. Unfortunately, Chaim doesn't have this liberty. He thinks of himself as a struggling child. He defines himself as the black sheep in his family, the failure of the school, the troubled one, the one who can't manage on his own. He doesn't have an internal way of feeling good. When we think about the relationship with Hashem, somebody who's grown up in such a part and parcel of every waking moment in their life, it's about how they feel with their Yiddishkeit. When they start not doing well in the other areas of life, they start thinking of themselves, they're a bad person. I'm worthless. I'm going to Gehenim. I hear this from all the kids that I meet. I'm going to Gehenim anyway. What's the point? Hashem doesn't want to listen to my tefillahs. Rosh Hashanah time, all the kids, they bring home, they have a nice project, and they bring home a scale. And it has on it the mitzvahs and the averis. And it's very cute, and they're proud to show it to you. And we put on more and more mitzvahs, and that gives us to a place that we're going to be able to be zeichah bedin. A child like Chaim, he looks at that scale, <clears throat> and he thinks he's got his averis way down on the other side. When he hears who's going to live and who's going to die, who's going to be successful, who's not going to be as successful, who's a Russian, who's a tzaddik, <clears throat> this is not a good time for Chaim. He probably leaves that scale in his knapsack. Let's think of Chaim. He's got low self-esteem. He's, he's not doing well in learning. He has trouble controlling his anger. He's got so much frustration and confusion inside. Chaim's getting sent out of class all the time now. He has many more instances of discipline and punishment as opposed to praise and success. How heavy is his scale on the negative side? Chaim's situation progresses. He's older now. He has cumulative frustration, many, many years of it. He hasn't felt good in years. In years. Now he misses minion. He stops saying brachas all the time. He starts watching things he shouldn't. What side of the scale does he feel he's on now? Elamaba? There's no place for a person like me in Elamaba. Rosh Hashanah is now the worst day of the year. <coughs> Children think in a very black and white way. They don't know how to say, I'm a good person, I have some things that I need to work on. They think of themselves, I'm good or I'm bad. When they think of themselves as bad, a number of different things happen. Either they start playing the part. How does a bad person act? How does a bad person talk? That's who I am today. Or they get depressed and they stop functioning. Another option is that they get extremely dysregulated emotionally because they have absolutely no idea what to do. Many kids do all of the above. When we think of all the Yom Tevim now, talking about Yiddish guy, we think of all the Yom Tevim. All the Yom Tevim become burdensome and painful. Pesach. From the time Pesach comes in, Chaim's already thinking about the Arab Abonim. He gets to the he gets to the Russia, Russia Mauweimer, his little brother as innocently he says, is Chaim a Russia? I've heard this a number of times. Shavuos comes along. Everybody's celebrating Kabbalah Satayra. They stay up and learn all night. What does Chaim do? He can learn. He doesn't leave his room. He's a stranger to Yom Tif, While everybody else is celebrating. Shabbos. Shabbos is the best day of the week. Not for struggling kids. Shabbos becomes the hardest day of the week. They have nothing to do. They have nothing to distract themselves. 
Chaim looks at the clock and counts down the minutes for Shabbos to be over. Three days Yom Tif are a living Gehenim. At some point, the only possible li- way to live without constant feelings of disappointment, shame, low self-esteem, low self-worth, overwhelming pain and anxiety, is turn off feeling towards all of these painful topics. It's like they turn off a switch. All of a sudden, they don't have to feel any pain. They don't care anymore. It's too painful to feel. It's too disturbing. Years and years and years of cumulative pain and frustration. I don't think about it. I tell myself I don't care. I can finally sleep at night. I finally feel some sense of calm. Deep down, those feelings are still there. But on the outside, that's the way it looks. They absolutely don't care. At one point, Chaim turns off his Yiddishkeit switch. He doesn't feel like a bad person anymore. He doesn't feel shameful. (coughs) He has some relief. The next thing that happens is they become a stranger to themselves. If we look deeper into this world of these struggling kids, When their healthy identity falls apart from their family, from their school, from their core values, they start to feel like strangers. Who am I? What does a person like me do? What don't they do? What do I stand for? In their mind, it's something like this. I don't know who I am. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's right or wrong. I don't know how I should look. I don't know how I should talk. I don't know how I should behave. Their sense of security and safety falls apart. The world is no longer a place that makes sense to them. When their person doesn't have a safe sense of self, they don't have a way to feel security. When there's no security, they don't have predictability. What's tomorrow going to bring? There's no safety, there's no sense of constancy. We function because we have a schedule. We wake up in the morning, we go to work, We go to Davin, we come home to our families, we go to sleep. If you don't have that, you don't have a sense of predictability and security in the world. You no longer, you no longer feel like you're living. You start surviving. I don't have time to talk about survival, but I can give another whole, another whole lecture about survival, how people act when they, when they're surviving. Most of these kids, when they're struggling, they hold it inside and it's years before, they, they, before they're, it manifests to the point that the parents really understand what's going on. When I meet the kids and I ask them, when did you feel the way you did? They always, repur- uh, they always report that they felt like they were turned off, they were dead inside for years before. Years before they were actually in Mahalo Shabbos, they have already stopped caring about Shabbos. Sometimes it looks like it's happening very, very suddenly. I hear, I hear from parents, from one day to the next, my daughter went from being a, a, a base Yaakov girl and all of a sudden she's wearing pants. Most times it's more of a slow process. They go from one school to the next school, from this class to that class, to this summer program. They go to an outward bound summer program. And slowly they become more and more disconnected from the mainstream. In any case, this is something that they've been struggling inside for a very, very long time. I used to say that all these kids are struggling from seventh grade, now I say from fifth grade, or younger. They don't want to burden their parents with it. They're too ashamed. They don't want to disappoint their parents. They don't want to see their parents fall apart. So they have a secret. And when a person holds a secret inside, it eats up at you. My parents would only know how bad I am. If they would only know that I don't daven or make brachas. If I only know that I don't wait between milchigs and fleishigs. Can you imagine? This causes a disconnect from their parents and it causes them to feel isolated from their whole family system. To compound all of this, when they hit adolescence, and this is where we usually see their their struggles manifesting, what happens when they become barabas mitzvah? They become mechuyiv and mitzvahs. 
They're not responsible for everything they do. Take a boy, he has now has the opportunity to, to wear tefillin. What does tefillin have inside? They have Kabbalah Soma Achos Shemayim. It talks about Schar V'Einish. Child's not allowed to wear tefillin. They don't have enough, a child doesn't know how to be Shemir Kedusha enough to be able to wear tefillin. This happens at the exact same time that a teenager's hormones kick in to the point the strongest level, their hormonal level will be the strongest and the highest the, than the rest of their lives. Troubles kids' minds will be in the wrong places a lot of the time. They're going to be listening to inappropriate things. They're going to be talking inappropriately to peers. They're going to be watching things that are inappropriate. Now let's think of sensitive Chaim. When he was younger, he looked at his father wearing his tefillin. His father looked majestic. He observed the pair, the pair, the glory his father had as he adorned his tefillin. He loved to wrap up his father's tefillin with care. He would kiss them and put them back in his father's tefillin bag. Now he has his own pair. He feels like an imposter wearing tefillin. He feels him impure, like he's sullying the tefillin. He's bringing Toma to them. Yet he looked forward to putting on tefillin since he was a little child. What does he do? Well, he has this skill. He knows how to turn his feeling off. He knows how to turn all the shame and guilt off. So he turns the feelings on, off and he puts his tefillin on. He can tune out all his feelings. There still is, at the same time, he knows what the tefillin represents. <coughs> There's a big heaviness as he puts on the tefillin. He ties himself up with the oil machu shamayim, and he has to declare sovereignty to Hashem and that he's going to keep all the mitzvahs. And he reminds himself that if he doesn't keep all the mitzvahs, it's not going to be good. His tefillin feel restrictive. They weigh a million pounds. I hear this from adults who've never taken off their tefillin, that that's the way they feel. Chaim is successful at ignoring these feelings. He can put them in the background. At least let me, uh, let me keep one important mitzvah. It only takes a, mitzvah, uh, a minute to put on. Sometimes he puts them on right before shkia for 30 seconds. He doesn't want to miss a day. He's able to hold this up for a number of years until he can't do it anymore. Now thinking of tefillin brings up the strongest feelings of feeling restricted and heaviness and dread. The strongest feelings of angst and pain. His tefillin sit in the closet. When he sometimes thinks of putting on tefillin, he experience, experiences a cacophony of feelings. He feels sadness, heaviness, feeling trapped. He feels anger at himself. He feels anger at Hashem. He feels dirty, unworthy. And this is just to say a few of the feelings. Better keep those tefillin in the closet. Many times we find that tefillin is the last thing that they give up, but it's the hardest thing to start again. Like I said, many adults who've never had this of letting go of the tefillin, they have this relationship of tefillin today. I've talked a lot about the boys. I want to talk a minute about Sneas. Sneas is usually the first to go away and the last to come back. I'm going to take Khani. She grew up in Lakewood. She's similar to Chaim. She has a very sensitive nishama. She cares very much. She has a flair for style and she loves art. She heard from the time that she was a little girl how wonderful the Imayis, Saar Rivka and Rachel and Leah were. She heard about the stories of Esther and Malka and about their tznias. She heard from her teachers about Kol Kfuda Bas Melech Pnimo and the pride of what it means to be a princess, a Bas Yisrael. <coughs> she yearned to be like them. She had similar challenges to Chaim. She didn't do well in school. She felt less and less part of the good crowd and felt worse and worse about herself. She eventually felt like a stranger to the pure innocent depiction of what it meant to be a, a, a Bas Yisrael. She needs to do something different. It's not working. She needs a way to express herself. Chani finds that she can express her, individual, in her individuality in her hairstyle. She changes her hairstyle. She learned that when she dresses up or dresses down, people notice her. 
She gets attention. She's a somebody. Now when she's a teenager, she gets noticed by, noticed by boys when she dresses. They give her compliments. Her peers look at her with admiration, yet she's found a way to express herself and be an individual. She's finally a somebody. She feels like she can invent a person in a way that's going to work for her. Hani thinks that she will try on different outfits and styles until she finds the one that feels comfortable and fits right for her. I'm eventually going to figure it out. In the meantime, I can enjoy the attention and the expression of dressing how I feel in the moment. I need to reclaim my life. I need to reclaim my body, which does not feel whole or pure. I will keep trying on new styles and expressions until it feels right. <coughs> when Khani looks at her old Beis Yaakov uniform, she feels smothered. She feels repressed. That uniform is restrictive. It's plain. It's full of discomfort. It's full of pain. You're going to find many outfits in Khani's closet, outfits that she hasn't worn for years. You're not going to find her Beis Yaakov uniform. That's the last thing she's going to put on from her keep in her closet. Now, I've talked a lot about regular challenges that kids face. This is when we, no, this is them when, we don't, when we don't bring in a real trauma. This is without a real trauma. When you take abuse, you take a real trauma that really sets a person off, traumatizes a brain that they can't function and they can't think. You could take whatever we've said and you could times it by 100. It's 2.23. I hope I've given a little bit of insight into how Growing up in a from house and having challenges in the developmental years, how it affects the trouble with Yiddishkeit. I don't want just this to be something depressing. When we can understand this as parents, when we can understand this as a community, we could shift our focus. We could shift our focus into how they can find a way, a way of security, how they can find an identity, how they can find the way that they can feel good about themselves. Because if all we're seeing is them not keeping Shabbos, if all we're seeing is them not going to shul, if all we're seeing is how short their, their skirt is, all we're doing is compounding the problem. These kids have a very, very different way of coming back. And it's not going to be through just putting all those mitzvahs back on, the ones that are so painful for them, the ones that they feel such a disappointment to, the ones that they have so much heaviness, that there's so much anxiety related to, the ones that it took years and years and years of when they felt smothered and when they felt shameful, those are not the places that they're gonna start. It might be the last things to come back. And we need to notice this. <coughs> We need to be able to start relating to them and be able to see the goodness in them. We need to be able to see their midas tevis. We need to be able to bring out how they can be successful. We need to be able to see how they can start feeling that they're part of our system, that they're part of our community, that they're part of our families. We need them to be able to rebuild in such a way that all these things that made them feel separate, that they can start coming back to. The reconnection will always be a very, very re a different reconnection than it will be with how, how it left. The first places that it could be where they can reconnect is with their families. That's the first places that it could be. And it'll only be if you can accept where they're at. If all you see, again, is all the things that they're not doing, if the, when they walk into the house, they see that all you notice is their dress, they see that you're looking at what type of hairstyle do they have today. They see that you're looking about you know, what time did they wake up, what they didn't do. You noticed if they didn't make a bracha or wash their hands. This is not a way that they're going to connect. If you could look at them as these struggling deep neshamas, and I don't know why, I don't know why Hashem gave this challenge to this generation, 
Some of the nicest people, some of the deepest people, some people who have the biggest sincerity that they have to go through these challenges and find a very, very different way, a way that's outside of the mainstream system. The mainstream system just didn't, it just didn't work for them. I don't know if I, I only have three minutes. I can either say it's about Torah or some people can ask some questions. I don't know, does anybody want, want to ask something? No? Do you want to ask something? Go ahead. Just talk louder so everybody can hear. So the question is, is a child who didn't have a big trauma to the knowledge, to the best of your knowledge, do they have a better chance of coming back? And also we talk about in general, like personal traumas, like about these children coming back. Like okay. So even with, the even with big traumas. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. if we look about, if we talk about abuse, the national statistics are one out, of every, one out of every four girls and one out of every six boys has a traumatic uh, story in, their, in growing up. And it sounds like a lot. But as therapists, we do see these numbers about the people that come in. It's about that percentage of people that have abuse histories. We don't have good statistics in our communities. We don't have it. I'm assuming that it might be a little bit less. But Unfortunately, we have a lot of these stories too. If we think of these overwhelming numbers, you think of a class of today, there's 25 kids in a class, there's 30 kids in a class. Now, how many kids are not making it? How many fall out of the system? I don't know, you have two kids per class, three kids per class. It's a lot higher of a number of the kids that experience abuse. The kids that experience abuse have a much higher percent percentage of possibility of falling out of the system. So we find extremely, extremely high numbers of kids that are struggling, at-risk kids that have gone through abuse. And sometimes we don't know about it until years and years and years later. My office, we ran a, we ran a, um, we ran a grant, it was called ASAP. They pay for abuse victims therapy for two years of therapy. And we ran this grant for three years. And I always had this in my mind. I was always thinking from just anecdotally as a therapist and as working in the field, I've always said that people need a lot of time before they're ready to come out and admit that something really terrible happened to them. And in my mind, it was like six years. So I asked the people who were taking the phone calls, I said, try to keep track. How long is it from what time that they're calling, uh, from the time the abuse happened, until when they're calling for help? So we found two things. When parents found out about it, parents would call right away. When the victims themselves were calling, it was anywhere between six and 30 years later. Almost never, almost never, two years, three years later, are they reaching out for help. So a lot of times we don't know until much later. But in any case, you know, we have small t traumas and all of these negative life experiences and cumulative, we call it, it's complex trauma, it's complex PTSD, it's not in the DSM diagnosis, but really, so too, abuse doesn't really fit in the DSM diagnosis because that's also only life-threatening situations. But we know as clinicians and as people in the field, people have the same tra traumatic <coughs> symptoms, whether or not they have cumulative trauma, they have complex trauma, many, many negative things that went on, it produces the exact same results. I'm just going to add on, when these kids struggle and they do all sorts of crazy things, that itself is traumatic. They all have trauma. I'm speaking on Sunday, everybody in this room has trauma. So are the statistics better? I wouldn't say the statistics are better because they all have a lot to work through. I would say the statistics are good in general. When we can give these kids enough love and enough support enough opportunity, enough possibility for healing, we're seeing most of these kids make it back. Yeah, go ahead. What can be done as preventive for younger children that they deal with the typical struggles? How can we do as much as we can preventively that they should come out whole as yeah. well? 
Yeah. Yeah, it's an excellent question. It's an excellent question. I wish I had an easy answer. But the thing that I do want to say, you know, you come to such a big event, and there's so many families there, and it feels like society's falling apart. I do want to say that, Baruch Hashem, uh, Baruch Hashem, things are better than they used to be. There's so many more programs in schools. The Rabbeim are so much more better tuned in. The parents are so much more aware. The kids are getting so many more services. There's so much more extracurricular uh, programs. There's so many more different options for kids that are struggling. We are doing things. It's never enough, and we have to keep doing things. Go ahead. My understanding is that the trauma starts with the parents, and then if you have like a sensitive child that could like pick up on that and zone in on that, could you address that? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Like, if the parents had trauma growing up in their own oh. lives. Oh. Well, I didn't think I was going to talk about this today. But <laughs> they, say, they say that Hitler is going to have an effect on us for five generations. And we're seeing this. That what? That Hitler is going to have an effect on us for five generations. And we're seeing this. We have repressed trauma. We have communal repressed trauma, and this generation is expressing it. <coughs> and the people in this room are maybe a little bit of a sandwich generation. They were close enough to the Holocaust. You know, we say that trauma victims need at least six years to put between trauma. Holocaust victims, they needed 75 years. And their kids weren't ready to deal with it or express it either. It was locked up. They didn't go there. But inside, there's a tremendous amount of suffering and anguish that's been going on and it hasn't been addressed. And the kids today, they're all experiencing it. And they might be experiencing it for all of us. So maybe we didn't do the work. And our kids have to do the work. But at least we can do is that we can help them do the work. Yeah, go ahead. The kid doesn't want to go to therapy. Kids don't want to go for therapy. Kids do not want to go for therapy. How do we help them? We help them as parents. We help them as parents. Every person, if, you, if your kids need therapy and they're living in your house, go for therapy. You're gonna become their therapist. Now you probably can't directly do therapy, but you can set up a therapeutic environment inside your home. But we try in therapy, when people first come in for therapy and they're not quite ready to work on their issues, we want to establish safety. We want to establish unconditional positive regard. We want to establish a sense of we see, we see the ability for them to solve their issues. We believe in them. We want to be able to identify their strengths. We want to be able to have a non-judgmental atmosphere. We want to take all stress and anxiety out of it. This is something that everybody can do in their house. It, t it takes a tremendous, tremendous amount of work. Tremendous amount of work. But if we work hard enough, I've seen enough parents do it. Really conflictual situations, really, really challenging situations. You work hard enough, you'll have a therapeutic environment. You'll have your child want to come home because he, knows, he or she knows that there's a lot of love in that house and there's good food waiting for them. And there's people who express interest in seeing them. And they're going to have good things to say. And they're going to give them compliments. And they're going to notice the good that they're doing. And even when they're doing something bad, they'll be able to support them and give them chizik through it. It takes a tremendous amount of work. So you go for therapy. You go for therapy anyway because you have to deal with everything that's going on. But we have the opportunity to do this. And I think that the people that come here, you're the brave. I'm getting a sign for five minutes. And I thought I was over time. Where this, these, are the, these are the brave people who come here and say, I'm willing to look past my shame, past my disappointment, past my own feelings of frustration and anger. I'm going to come. I'm going to learn. I'm going to get support. I'm going to understand what works for these kids. I'm going to understand how they think and feel. I'm going to understand why they're doing what they're doing. And I'm going to figure out what I can do to be in the best position to help out my kids. Go ahead. Yes, 
six yeah. modules in like defined to lead to therapy later on. I'm but not. I'm not aware of books that, that uh, teach us about how to establish a home as a therapeutic environment. I am not aware of it. And if you're looking for the right therapist, you need to find a therapist that's familiar with this, with struggling teens and young adults. Because most parenting uh, therapists are not going to give you this type of insight. They're going to be telling you about how you have to establish rules and how you have to have discipline and how you have to follow through and how you have to, you, you can't be an enabler. You know, a lot of those types of things. And that's not going to create a therapeutic environment. That would work for kids who don't have any issues. This is a whole different, you need to find therapists, you need to find people. Baruch Hashem, there's a tremendous amount of them here at this conference. So shop around, get to know some people, go into a lot of classes. I'm sure you pick up a lot of stuff. Go ahead. Yeah. I don't know if I'm allowed to, but I can recommend a book. Okay, go ahead, sure. Dr. Reggie Melrose has a book, You Can Heal Your Child. And okay, good, thank you. Yes, go ahead. One thing I've always had a problem with, young adults, once they're over 18, the parents really don't have any say in, like, my Once they're young adults, if they're going to a therapist already, and you don't feel that they're helping them or directing them in, to the right you know, you, you don't have any input to tell the therapist what is going on with the child. Once they're really struggling, you have very little input right. about how the direction the is going to go. Is not directing right. them in the right way. Right. What you can do, your part is what you could do in the home. It's not going to be about the type of therapy. That's not going to be your part. Sometimes, in the best of cases, you're going to develop such a therapeutic home environment that they're going to come over to you and they're going to actually seek your guidance and help and direction. It's rare. It happens sometimes. If you can all get there, you're very, very fortunate. Go ahead. Glad you're raising your hand. Mm -hmm. I have to. Yeah. Uh, sibling that rejects the trusted sibling. Yeah. Yeah. How to deal with siblings. Yeah. Is that, is that one of the forums here today about how to deal with siblings? Yeah. Well, I can't answer that in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Next year, Mir Tashem. Next year, Mir Tashem. I am I'm going to be here for the weekend. If anybody wants to talk to me, you're welcome to come over. I hope I've been somewhat informative. Again, I want to give Yashika for everybody for being here. It takes a tremendous amount of strength. You're all a bunch of heroes. It's a big Kiddush Hashem. Thank you. Thank you.